Hello and welcome to another episode of the World War II podcast. I'm Angus Wallace. I'm sure we're all fairly familiar with the events of that day of infamy, the 7th of December 1941. The Japanese launched their whirlwind in the Pacific with the attack on Pearl Harbour. Within hours, they would invade Malaya, an operation that would outflank the British fortress Singapore. Uh, Japanese units would land on the Philippines and the conquest of the Dutch East Indies, modern-day Indonesia, would begin. Less well-known is the Japanese attack on the British territory of Hong Kong. The island had been ceded to the British in 1841. It served as a valuable harbour for ships trading with the Chinese port of Canton. Since then, the colony had grown to include the Kowloon Peninsula and new territories on the mainland, giving Hong Kong a land border with China. Now, we've looked at various early attacks made by the Japanese in December 1941, but I've often wondered what happened to Hong Kong. Well, to answer that, I'm joined by Philip Cracknell. Philip gives battlefield tours of Hong Kong, as well as having written the book, The Battle for Hong Kong, December 1941. But before we get to that, can I remind you that this podcast is brought to you by listeners like yourself. In becoming patrons of the podcast, they help me to find the time to put the show together. Now, if you're interested, you can find out how to become a patron at patreon.com slash ww2podcast. Philip, thanks for joining me. Let's start with um, some Hong Kong background. It's a oh it's a British colony. Or is it a protectorate? I mean, what 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 is it officially? It was a British Crown colony. You know, what you say is quite interesting. I mean, it's true that Hong Kong doesn't get that much attention. And I think, you know, part of the reason in Britain is that British knowledge of that geographic area of the Pacific is really a bit limited to Singapore, Malaya and Burma. Burma, obviously, kind of in the period of captivity because of the the railroad and the way prisoners were treated there. And then Burma later in the war because um, it's where the tide was t- had turned and the Japanese were being pushed back. In Canada, the battle for Hong Kong is very well understood and known, much more so than in Britain. And the, I think the reason for that is, well, first of all, there were 2,000 Canadian troops sent out in November, a few weeks before war began. And it ended up being, for Canada their first experience of battle in World War II. It was their first casualties, their first deaths, and their first involvement in the Second World War, as late as December 1941. And then, then of course, you know, when we think of of Singapore and Malaya, Malaya, Singapore was the impregnable fortress. Hong Kong was known to be a a strategic liability. Uh, uh, They knew that they couldn't hold Hong Kong. So Hong Kong had you know, a paucity of uh, sh- of warships and, and aircraft and equipment and men. It was sitting there really sort of like um, a bait. It was going to be sacrificed, you know, but but not without a fight. You know, what, what was the difference between Hong Kong and Singapore to make it a strategic liability? It was, it was too close to the Japanese. So it was well within range of uh, Japanese aircraft bases in Formosa, present-day Taiwan, and, and, and in southern China around Canton. And not only that, there were also several divisions of the Japanese 23rd Army based around Canton, very, very close to Hong Kong. So Hong Kong was really, you know, it was sort of surrounded by Japanese military presence. Uh, and, and that's the reason why it was so ill-prepared. But it doesn't really explain why the 2,000 Canadians were sent if Churchill really believed that, you know, Hong Kong could not be defended or relieved once attacked. Is that slightly odd? Because you've also, you've got, I mean, it's the gin drink, wonderfully titled gin drinkers line. Uh, And I don't know why it's called the gin drinkers line. It's just so wonderfully British. But uh, it it, it was known as the Oriental Maginot line. Well, um, Oriental Maginot line, the Maginot line didn't prove to be much use. But that would at least demonstrate there's some effort to make it into uh, a defensive position, uh, the territories. Well, the gin drinkers line is so called because it runs from gin drinkers bay. But why gin drinkers bay was called gin gin drinkers bay, 
I don't think anybody's quite sure. They think it might be related to boozy picnic parties uh, long ago, but probably not anywhere near wartime because um, well, gin, gin was a ladies' drink in 1941. It was very popular in the hotels and bars in Hong Kong and was basically served with crushed ice and called a gym lad. But the, m- most men drank whiskey and soda. And the, the beggars, there were thousands of beggars living on the streets in Hong Kong, used to um, call out to uh, passers-by, European passers-by, no mama, no papa, no whiskey soda, and would probably earn a <laughs> dollar or two for that cheek. Well, where does the gin drinker's line, when is it built? Is it built in the late 30s? Is it a reaction to the Japanese... Uh, attacking China and them, uh, you know, a land border with the new territories. Yes, it was. I mean, I, I suppose it, it was a reaction, firstly, to the withdrawal from Japan, Japan, or one would say the abrogation of the Washington Treaties, which Japan was a signatory to, and which prevented the signatories, in, in particular, American, America, Britain, and Japan from building defensive fortifications and other fixed defences in the Asia-Pacific area. And then, as you say, that, well, that, that occurred in 1936. And then in 1937, Japan invaded the rest of China, other than Manchuria, which it invaded in 1931. So those two things, the abrogation of the Washington Treaties, the Japanese sort of uh, drive to rearm, the aggressive invasion of China in 1937 – led Britain to start defending um, or building defences in Hong Kong and Singapore. And, and the gin drinkers line was um, a 10-mile stretch of line. Not quite like the Maginot line, because the Maginot line was really almost like a solid concrete line of fortifications. The, the gin drinkers line, well, 10 miles long, following very rough terrain, you know, mountainous terrain, um, stretched from one side of the Kowloon Peninsula to the other. And it basically consisted of three infantry battalions and their positions, which broke down into company positions, platoon positions. And it had a number of pillboxes. So there were about 90 pillboxes stretched out along the line. There was one area which was very fortified called the Shingman Redoubt, which had con- concrete sort of firing bays, pillboxes, and interconnecting tunnels. But otherwise, the line on the ground would have looked like slit trenches, barbed wire entanglements known as Dana wiring, and, um, you know, weapons pits and um, slit trenches. You, you've alluded to the fact that, they, that Churchy Churchill and you know, the British never really felt that Hong Kong could hold out. So was there a, a plan in place? Uh, you know, military planners like to have everything planned out in advance, even though, you know, no plan survives first contact, but was there a plan in place uh, by the British for uh, if Hong Kong was ever attacked? Well, there was a plan. There was a defence plan, which was updated you know, several times. And the plan basically, um, say in 1938, the defence plan, as it was first formulated, basically kind of was premised on the idea of holding up the Japanese advance, and they were assumed, the Japanese warriors assumed to cross the border from China. It was probably assumed that, that was the most obvious way they would come in. But in fact, you know, there was also concern they could do amphibious landings, as they'd done in nearby Daya Bay, or also known as Beers Bay, uh, which is only 40 kilometers from Hong Kong. But anyway, the, the, the essence of the defense plan was slow down the Japanese advance, buy time in the mainland, buy time to carry out demolitions of infrastructure, ports, roads, bridges, factories, oil tanks, and so on. And then it was always assumed that the troops would then have to eventually withdraw or evacuate to the island, to Hong Kong Island. And then the island would be held for as long as possible. And by holding the island, you could deny access to the harbour to the enemy. As long as possible was assumed to be several months, three to six months. And It was also premised on relief, relief coming from the bastion of Britain's defences in the Far East, Singapore and Malaya. But of course, you know, when it all broke out, um, Singapore and Malaya were under attack at the same time. And then, of course, you know, a few days after the battle began, the two biggest British capital ships were sunk, Prince Wells, and I I forget, what was the other one, the Repulse? Repulse, yeah. Um, And so there was 
there was no question of um, troops coming from Singapore to, to relieve uh, Hong Kong. No, something else that occurred to me, the tensions are mounting throughout 1941, but we weren't at war. Does that mean that when the Japanese launch all these attacks, places like uh, Hong Kong, presumably their civilians had been free to move around Hong Kong and, and the new territories in Kowloon. And did they have a network of spies? Was the uh, Japanese Imperial Army fully briefed of the British dispositions in the area? Yeah, they were, Angus. They were. There were at least 2,000, maybe more Japanese living and working in pre-war Hong Kong. When the Japanese attacked China, it was thought there might be reprisals amongst the population in Hong Kong. But actually there weren't, and the Japanese lived quite openly in Hong Kong. And there are sort of famous stories about um, the barbers at the Hong Kong Hotel. The Hong Kong Hotel was the main night spot in Victoria, the capital of Hong Kong. And it was known as the Grips. And um, the, the barbers there happened to be Japanese. And so as they were snipping, snipping the, the, the hair and the sideburns, they were digging for information. They were reporting information back to the head of Japanese military intelligence at the Japanese consulate. And likewise, the massage therapist, who probably did a bit more than regular massage, and the um, the various you know the various other professions you know tea dancers hostesses in cocktail bars all the citizens including those the Japanese citizens including those that were in maybe respectable jobs like trading companies banks and so on they were all kind of acting as citizen spies they were all engaged reporting that information back to the to the Japanese consulate and as a result when the Japanese did cross the border they had amazingly good information which showed every detail of the British fixed offences. So they knew where, where everything was. They knew where the, they knew where the minefields were. They knew where the wiring was. They knew where the batteries were. They knew where the troops were deployed. The, the attack goes in. I'm right, is it the same day or is it the day after the, the attack goes in, uh, after Pearl Harbour? It's just a few hours after Pearl Harbour. Hours after. So, and is it, do they attempt to attack from the air, knocking out uh, strategic places that, uh, as they do at uh, places like the Philippines? So the battle began on Monday the 8th of December. On Sunday, the military commander, who'd only arrived a few months before, Major General Maltby, was sitting in St. John's Cathedral at his usual pew. Apparently, he'd just read the lesson, had sat down at the pew, and a, a military orderly came into the cathedral, his um, hobnail boots resonating on the stone floor. Heads turned as he marched up to the military commander at the front. Words were whispered, and um, the military commander left the cathedral, together with uh, a group of staff officers. A defence council was convened. And a state of emergency was declared at about noon on Sunday, the 7th of December. And one can only assume that the information that had been reported back was the very, very large formations of Japanese troops that had by now, and actually there had been reports coming in for some time, but had now been clearly observed across the other side of the border. And so there was very little time to prepare. Well, Sunday afternoon, troops started mobilizing. Civil defence was activated as of the state of emergency. But for most people, they had no idea a war was on. There was a big carnival, Tate's Carnival, at Caroline Hill near Causeway Bay. The lights were on. Hong Kong was lit up like a Christmas tree. And yes, as you said, there had been tension from time to time. But nobody was ever sure that Japan would really go to war, risk everything by... Um, attacking uh, British possessions, which would bring America into the war. Surely they wouldn't do that. They're just blustering. This is what many people thought. Although the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor at something like 4 o'clock in the morning, Hong Kong time, it wasn't until 8 o'clock in the morning, for many people, they realized that the war had started when they heard the, the um, sound of bombs going off at Kai Tak Airport in Sham Shi Po. Um, so the very first strike was about 8 o'clock in the morning with that um, bombing of Kai Tak Airport, the destruction of the Royal Air Force aircraft on the ground. And at about the same time, the Japanese crossed the border and started moving inland and closing in on the uh, gin drinkers' line. <laughs> 
I think most people possibly thought that if we were going to war, there'd be some catalyst that everyone would then realise that war started. They hadn't quite expected the Japanese to... Uh, the surprise is the scale of the start of the war. You know, it's not just Hawaii. It's they, they launch so much all at the same time, uh, which is what catches people out more than anything else. So the defence of the gin drinkers line, you know, it, 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 the Oriental Maginot line... Um, <laughs> how, how yeah, does a great description it, it, it is it, it is when you realize how how it goes <laughs> um how, how did it go for the uh for the british you know it, they, they would at least presumably like to hold them back days if not weeks if not months yeah that's right well it only lasted about five days it was manned by two indian infantry battalions and one british battalion british battalion was the second battalion the royal scots the attack mainly focused on the Royal Scots sector, although the two Indian battalions were also facing artillery fire and probing attacks. On the first day, the Japanese moved across the border, clockwise, anticlockwise, and straight down the middle in a kind of three-point pincer movement, if you like. And the British troops had forward troops out in front of the line who were guarding demolition teams of Royal Engineers, who commenced a pre-planned operation of blowing up roads, uh, bridges, tunnels, all of which was designed to slow the Japanese advance down towards the gin drinkers line. By Tuesday, the um, forward troops had completed their task, the Royal Engineers had completed their demolitions, and the forward troops had re returned back behind the British line of defence. Then on Tuesday night, quite late at night, uh, the Japanese made their first strike. They saw an opportunity to attack the uh, Shingman Redoubt. They seized the redoubt by surprise. The redoubt was a strong point. The loss of the redoubt came as a huge shock. I mean, like most stories in the battle, it was inadequately manned. It was defended by one platoon of about 25 men from a company of 2nd Battalion Royal Scots. And the commander of that company, a rather flamboyant character, six foot six, mustachioed, named Captain Cyril Jones, but known as Potato Jones, or even Pounsy Jones, which even less charitably, who hadn't enamoured himself with his military commanders because he was a, a great sort of party person and had a reputation for hard drinking and um, hard partying. Anyway, he had his um, company HQ in um, an artillery observation post, AOP there, always referred to, at the back of the redoubt. So he, he, you know, his HQ was captured. The platoon and the HQ um, and the four gunners that manned the AOP were all eventually killed or captured. I think one or two might have got away. So that was a huge shock. And then two days later, on Thursday the 11th, all efforts to try and recapture the Shigman Redoubt were a bit half-hearted because there weren't sufficient resources and the Japanese had kind of created a strong defence there. The next move was um, the, Jap the rest of the Japanese army started the advance on the, on the Royal Scots sector of the line. They attacked an area known as Golden, Golden Ridge, the high ground just behind the Shigman Redoubt. And... As a result of the attack, two of the Royal Scots companies withdrew disorderly and withdrew back probably a distance of three or four kilometers to an area called Lychee Cock. But one of the, the, the Royal Scots companies, D Company, held on to Golden Hill throughout the whole of that day and never withdrew and were attacked by considerably larger numbers um, this is one company being attacked by at least a battalion. And it was, again, you know, the kind of the superior, superiority in numbers that resulted in the two companies that withdrew, bolting. But of, of the two companies that withdrew, at least one platoon remained where they were. So it wasn't a complete withdrawal, but it was, um, it, it was pretty ugly. And I think, you know, the commanders panicked when they saw um, the line collapsing and moving back and the two forward companies withdrawing, at least substantially with, withdrawing. And so on that day, on Thursday, as a result of uh, weakness in the Royal Scots sector of the line, 
the decision was made to evacuate the mainland. And then the, the Royal Scots had to break off in fighting, um, especially those at uh, Golden Hill. You know, when, when those two companies withdrew on Thursday, um, a lot of reinforcements were rushed into that area, armored cars, brain gun carriers. Anyway, on, once the decision to evacuate had been made, the two Indian battalions were to retreat to, in a fighting retreat being pressed by the Japanese along the line of hills to an area called Devil's Peak. And from there, they would cross to the island. So Royal Scots were taken off quite quickly from Kowloon, from Kowloon City. The evacuation of the two Indian battalions was like a mini Dunkirk, you know, with small civilian craft, with motor torpedo boats, with destroyers, with lighters and launches all being used to desperately get these men across under the cover of darkness um, before Japanese aircraft would arrive in the um, in the daylight. What surprised me was that actually it struck me as possibly been quite a success. The considering breaking off. Retreating and retreating across a large, you know, a big, a substantial body of water. They actually did quite a uh, a good job getting so many people out. They did, they did, and you know, the Royal Scots got got a lot of bad coverage for their part in this, and they were never awarded the battle honours for Hong Kong. And I've always found that you know quite unjust in a way because all my research has shown me that the Royal Scots fought extremely gallantly especially on the island. And yes, you know, two depleted companies, I mean, a company would normally be at least 120 men. Um, C Company was down to 36 men when they withdrew. In the whole history of the Battle of Hong Kong had been small platoons or company counterattacks against much, much stronger um, Japanese formations. So in a way, it wasn't really surprising that these two companies withdrew. Both their commanding officers had been killed in action. And without leadership, they um, they pulled back. So once they get back, you know, uh, once we're down to the island, uh, Maltby, uh, Major General Maltby has uh, five or six days, almost a week to organise defence of the island. Now, that strikes me as quite a long time once you know what's what's going on. Um, how does he use it? Does he manage to stiffen the defences? I don't think he did, really, because, I mean, like, they, they already had a, um, a plan agreed. So it, the plan just went into action, and um, there was some movement around the troops, but generally Maltby had, couldn't be sure how the island would be invaded. There was a possibility that they could come by air. There could be, uh, they could use parachutists. There was um, a very high possibility that they would land on the sandy beaches on the south side of the island. But likewise, they could cross the harbour and they could land right in the middle of Victoria, the capital city of Hong Kong, with a huge you know, expatriate civilian population uh, and creating terrors in the streets of Victoria. They really could have landed anywhere. So if, if you like, there was a week roughly of fighting on the mainland because the final withdrawal occurred on, probably getting, getting my dates wrong here, but Saturday, which I think would be the 13th. So the first week was fighting on, fighting on the mainland and evacuation to the island. Uh, the second week was on, until, the eight, uh, until Thursday the 18th was the island under siege. So during that week, the Japanese basically pulverized the island with aerial bombing, artillery fire. They picked off pillboxes that lined the shoreline, picking off their Leon light positions, picking off the pillboxes, softening up the defenses. And on Saturday the 13th, they sent a peace mission across, suggesting that, um, I mean, they've captured the mainland. It's pretty much all over. Why don't you surrender was the message they delivered to the governor, Sir Mark Young. And they sent a second peace mission across uh, later in the week, around Wednesday, just before they invaded the island. Again, calling on the uh, British governor to save lives, to accept the inevitable, and to, um, and to surrender the island. But the governor sent them away with a rejoinder that he would... Um, he would refuse to entertain any further such um, requests from the Japanese. And so the Japanese realized they would have to make 
uh, they would have to cross the harbour under fire and land troops on the island and fight their way to the finish. I wonder if the uh, governor had looked at what was happening across the rest of the Pacific and, and, and thought if the plan that he'd be relieved would actually play out, or if at that point he had doubts. He knew by that, by that time, he knew. I, I, I guess the, the message he subsequently received from Churchill was, you have to resist to the end. Uh, those were the words, resist to the end. Churchill was very firm about this, that every day that you can hold out will help the Allied cause. And the governor, Samart Young, was also new to Hong Kong. He'd only arrived in um, September 1941. And he didn't, I guess, want to be the first governor of a crown colony to surrender a British colony in I don't know how many years. I, you know, I, I, you know, as far as I can see from my research, you'd have to go back to the American war of independence before such uh, an event had occurred with the surrender at Yorktown by General Cornwallis. The governor just wanted to hold on as long as he could. But he, you know, he must have known that there was only one way this could end. And for, he did know. He, you know, he knew it was mat a matter of just holding out. I, I sometimes wonder when the military commander arrived, General Maltby, did he realize he was being given such a bum steer? I mean, like, we, we historians, we all know that, um, you know, Churchill knew there wasn't, um, uh, in the, the words were, not the slightest chance of defending Hong Kong or relieving Hong Kong should it be attacked. But, of course, that message never went out to anybody else, understandably, because you wouldn't want to destroy the morale. And if, you know, that message was known, would the troops even bother to fight? I mean, as it was, they're not fighting for home and hearth. I've often wondered, though, if they, it was a complete underestimation, believing ourselves to be, uh, you know... Asia had been sort of do dominated by Europeans, or at least looked down on those countries that weren't colonies, were looked down upon as, you know, as, you've know, got a classic propaganda with the Japanese with their glasses on. So there, were, there was a sort of a, a, a belief in moral superiority. And so I, sus I suspect those guys thought, well, you know, we've got the biggest navy in the world. We've got Fortress Singapore. We've never been beaten for years. We've sailed up and down gunboat diplomacy. You know, the whole the whole phrase gunboat diplomacy is based around China, isn't it, in the what, 1830s, something like that. So, that, so that I, I suspect there was just an arrogance and an overconfidence. And then when it all happened, it, it, it's a real... Uh, uh, it was a shit show, but uh, <laughs> well, it was a shit show. It's a pretty good description, and I think you're absolutely right. They underestimated the Japanese. They un they they underestimated their ability to fight at night. They underestimated their ability to conduct um, aerial warfare, and I think they were quite shocked. I mean, the Japanese, on the whole, outfought the British. Those that fought against the Japanese considered they were extremely brave. They would attack in situations where no other army would attack, and they would defend to the very last. And so, you know, without a doubt, they were brave. Crossing the harbour, you know, making an amphibious assault, yeah, there, if you look at D-Day, you look at anything to do with water and amphibious assaults, are incredibly difficult. Yet the Japanese seemingly just dash it off. Is that unfair to the British? No, you're quite correct. I mean, sort of in the few days before the landings on the island, they'd gathered up sampans and boats and things, but they also br brought with them um, raiding boats. And there are a few photographs showing um, these landing boats being trucked down towards the shoreline. They went across on the night of Thursday, the 18th of December. They used um, three regiments each regiment using two of its three battalions, each battalion consisting of a 1,000 infantrymen. So in one night, you had uh, 6,000 Japanese infantry, plus supporting troops like artillery and so on. So I estimate conservatively, because we don't know the actual number, but I estimate that it would have been at least 8,000 that were landed in the first three or four hours of the um, invasion of the island. And they landed on a stretch of the northeast shore of the island, which ran from North Point, where there was a power station, through, through to Taiku in the middle of the sector, and on to a place called Shao Kei Wan, 
Along this stretch of shoreline, the British defenders consisted of one infantry battalion, but I ought to rephrase that because it wasn't the whole battalion. It was uh, three companies of that battalion with a further company held back in reserve. So three companies of Rajputs. Uh, they were known as the 5th uh, Battalion, 7th Rajput Regiment, um, under their commander, Lieutenant Colonel Cadogan Rawlinson. Isn't that a lovely name? Very British. <laughs> yeah, very. Well, there's another guy who was, um, there was the aide-de-camp of the governor. His name was um, Captain, um, oh, what was it? Oh, yeah, C- Captain Batty Smith. <laughs> and he really is, you know, he's mustachioed. He's, all, all his photographs show him wearing riding boots with spurs and carrying a, a, a riding crop. Sounds like a character from P.G. Woodhouse novel. Absolutely. <laughs> or Boy's yeah. Own or anywhere. So going back to the defences, so you had this um, part of an Indian battalion and one company of Canadian, Canadian infantry, a couple of forts around the Shalke One area, a coastal defence fort, an anti-aircraft fort, and a, ch- a bunch of old chaps. When I say old chaps, I mean they were over the combatant age of 55. You know, th- these old boys had all m- previous military experience. They'd all fought in the First World War. Some of them had fought in the South African War. Some of them had, some of them had been in the Camel Corps. But they wanted to play their part. So they formed what was known as the Special Guard, known as the Hughes Group. And they were at their battle stations on the 18th, which happened to be to defend the North Point Power Station. Their role was ori- originally designed to be preventing sabotage and fifth columnist activity. And so on that shoreline, you, uh, again, my estimation is that there were no more than 800 British defenders, three companies of Rajputs, one company of Canadians, and the old, the old fellows at the North Point Power Station, the Hughes Group. And they were faced by 8,000 Japanese, so it was 10 to 1. The result was they were overwhelmed. Great courage was shown, um, and I think that's the story throughout the Battle of Hong Kong. I mean, like, you know, yes, they were up against superior numbers. Yes, they were up against very good first-class troops. But, you know, it's absolutely fair to say that they fought very gallantly. And the Hughes Group certainly fought very gallantly holding the power station, you know, the oldest of these old chaps to be killed in action was Private Sir Edward DeVoe. And DeVoe, uh, there's a road in Hong Kong, DeVoe Road, and it was named after a former governor of Hong Kong. And Private Sir Edward DeVoe was um, the nephew of uh, that previous governor of Hong Kong. He was also secretary of the Hong Kong Club. And the Hong Kong Club was like the you know, the pillar of the establishment. So, um, you know, hats off to him. He died with his, you know, face to the enemy um, at the grand old age of 77. 77. Fantastic. Fantastic. Where's the Royal Navy? My assumption is there's a a, a stiff Royal Navy presence. Why are they not batting them out of the water as all these uh, amphibious boats come across? Well, before I talk about the Navy, I'll just mention the RAF first of all. The RAF only had five aircraft. They're all, they're all biplanes, and they were totally unsuitable for modern warfare. Three of them were wildebeests, which, you know, were torpedo, car- torpedo bombers, uh, were biplanes. And the other two aircraft were um, known as walrus. They were amphibians, flying boats, moored, moored uh, on the water. Those five aircraft, well, actually four of them were destroyed on the first day. One actually survived the bombing. They were never used. They were hopeless. The loss of the RAF in Hong Kong made no difference to the outcome. And later on, the RAF were the, the kite out was evacuated, and the RAF were used in the, an, an infantry type of role. Back to the Navy. The Navy went much better. They had three World War One destroyers, two of which, by prior arrangement or prior planning, um, sailed on the first day of the war to Singapore. Uh, one of which was sunk off the coast of Malaysia, and one survived. And that left one one of those very old fashioned First World War destroyers. HMS Thracian. And Thracian had had her rear gun removed, her after deck cleared, and was fitted out for mine laying. So she was busy mine laying when war began on the morning of Monday, 8th of December. So that left that one destroyer stroke mine layer. 
And then they had four gunboats, but two of them were very small and ineffective. But there were two quite big gunboats. One was known as HMS Sikala, although I think they pronounced it Chikala. But anyway, I always pronounce it Sikala, which may be wrong. And HMS Moth. And these gunboats were quite sort of well-armed. They had two six-inch guns, one forward, one aft. They had a three-inch gun, and they had a pom-pom gun. But when war started, Moth, by bad timing, happened to be in dry dock and never got out of dry dock and was eventually scuttled after the dry dock had been flooded. The other boat, Chikala, or Sikala, fought throughout the battle until she was sunk in the Lama Channel. And the only other remaining naval presence was eight motor torpedo boats. I'm not going to mention what they're called auxiliary patrol vessels or APVs because they were just converted tugs and trawlers and things used for minefield patrolling and so on. So the the naval presence was also kind of weak. The motor torpedo boats, the next day after the Japanese landings, they, they, they went into the harbour. It's sometimes compared to the charge of the light brigade or the, the naval charge of the light brigade. They went in in twos. It's now Friday, the 19th of December. Uh, the Japanese have established a bridgehead on the island. During the night, they've moved up uh, um, to take over the high ground. They, the whole of the Japanese army is now moving on the central point of the island, known as Wong Nai Chung Gap. And in the meantime, the Japanese are ferrying across leisurely uh, loads of supplies and additional troops. So r- the Royal Navy is order it goes out to go in and sink and uh, sink as many landing craft as you can. So the first two boats went in. Top speed would be about 38 knots, roaring into the harbour, sinking many of the boats just with their wake, using their double-barreled Lewis guns to fire at point-blank range at enemy landing craft and launches. And as they come into the harbour, they're fired at by artillery and machine guns from the mainland, but also from the north shore of the island, where they weren't even expecting Japanese to be. Anyway, the two, those two um, boats were very successful, but now the Japanese are scurrying back to their ports on either side as fast as their um, surviving craft can carry them. And then the next two boats come in. They were waiting at the sort of far end of the harbour. So the, the two boats exiting, some of them badly damaged, were in fact both dam- damaged by machine gun and uh, cannon fire from aircraft, and then the next two boats come in. Again, they're fired at from each side. They're attacked by a Japanese aircraft. And by the time they get to the area between the North Shore and Devil's Peak, the Japanese have all bolted. So, I mean, they do the, what, what, what they can, is scouring around looking for targets. One of the motor, boats is, uh, motor torpedo boats is blown up. The other one returns. And then two more motor torpedo boats are waiting to go in. But meanwhile, a signal has gone out that they should not go in. Um, one boat's been lost, the enemy have scattered, and one of these boats either didn't get the signal or ignored the signal and went into the harbour and was also blown up. I mean, it was gallant, it was kind of Nelsonic, but it was, it was kind of like, it really was. I mean, there, it was like the charge of the light brigade because they're being fired from the left-hand side, the right-hand side, from above, and these motor torpedo boats are wooden. They're, they're fairly lightly armed, relaunched torpedoes, which wouldn't have been much good in the harbour, depth charges, which wouldn't have been that good in relatively shallow water. So Hong Kong, sort of hilly, upland, mountainous, I, I guess is one way of describing it. I would have thought it should have favoured the defenders, but they seem to be, the Allies seem to be outmanoeuvred by the Japanese. It, it, moving at partly moving at speed, but I wonder how much of this was to do with uh, poor communication, sort of in a breakdown of uh, command and control between uh, the Allied forces. I think um, there was the fog of war. There was poor communication. General Mobley fought the Battle of Hong Kong from a deep underground bunker known as the Battle Box, and um, he didn't really come out of that sort of battle box throughout the war. And the information getting back to the battle box was fuzzy. There was no radio communication or almost none, certainly not in the army. Uh, The Navy had it. The army had some, but very little. So all of all the communication was by telephone. And although telephone cables were laid underground, 
uh, during the bombardments, the telephone lines were being cut all the time. And so during daytime bombardments, most positions were out of telephone contact. And the linesmen who, who had the job of repairing telephone lines had one of the most dangerous jobs in the battle, you know, fixing telephone lines um, while under fire. And so, you know, without telephone communication, the only other form of communication which was used extensively was runners. But, you know, very often, as, as I suppose in every battle where runners are used, the runners never made it. And so the information didn't get through. They were shot before they could deliver the message. So the communication was bad. The commanders continually misunderstood the or underestimated the numbers of Japanese troops that had got ashore. They thought there were much smaller numbers. They had no idea there were thousands of troops ashore. And the number of troops defending Wong Nai Chung Gap probably would have been about only a few hundred. But there were 6,000 infantry heading their way. And, and they moved so fast. They moved through the night. Uh, the Japanese troops moved quietly. They were um, a kind of canvas boot with a space for a toe, known as Jikatabi. During that first night, they captured quite a lot of the high ground, uh, Mount Parker. The next morning, they captured Jardine's lookout. By, um, by Friday morning, they were attacking Wong Nai Chung Gap, this sort of central point on the island, a strategic point, if you like. And um, they attacked, you know, from three different directions. The first troops to get to Wong Nai Chung Gap, they bypassed the North Point power station, and that was their usual style. If there were points of resistance, they would bypass it, pick it at, and then carry on. So they carried on up the hill, made their HQ beside what the Japanese commander described as a large lake, but was in fact a reservoir. The reservoir today is, has been built over, filled in, built over. It's now um, a luxury apartment block called Bremer Hill Mansions. And nearby Bremer Hill Mansions and what used to be the reservoir is today the Chinese International School. And a little bit above that, you know, only 50, 150 meters, I would say, from the reservoir is a path known as the Cecil's Ride, which goes all the way to Wong Nai Chung Gap. So they followed this path, running into small British um, forward-defended localities, consisting basically of a machine gun, barbed wire, and a section of men. And they overcame these one after the other. And um, by morning, um, the first of their troops were arriving at Wong Nai Chung Gap quickly seizing the police station at the centre of the gap, uh, seizing an advanced medical dressing station, capturing an anti-aircraft battery. And they were still all bunched up on this path known as the Cecil's Ride when dawn broke and, and the daylight um, enabled the pillboxes on Jardine's lookout to be able to fire their Vickers guns into this mass of Japanese troops at the gap. And that's probably where the Japanese suffered their you know, the highest casualties, that in the Battle of mm. Stanley. So so what point is it all over for Maltby and the British? It's really all over from that point, from the point that Wong Nai Chung Gap was captured. There were reports that China, the Chinese Nationalist Army were coming to their assistance and were close to the border of Hong Kong. But most people don't really believe that. You know, yes, there might have been a plan before the war that should Hong Kong be attacked, the Chinese army would, um, uh, would, would attack from the rear. But the Chinese always envisaged that, you know, the British troops would be kind of advancing rather than retreating or, 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 you know, kind of under siege. And once the Chinese troops saw how quickly the Japanese had captured Wong Nai Chung Gap, if there were any plans to come to the rescue, they were soon dropped. And, you know, the, the Chinese troops didn't fight like this. They didn't look for, open conflict with the Japanese. It was more of a, a war of attrition, a guerrilla type of warfare, attacking the rear lines. And So, um, you know, I, I would say once, once Wong Nai Chung Gap had been captured on Friday the 19th of December, the, the, the battle was over in all but name. And for the next, you know, I mean, it only lasted barely a, a week after that. I mean, uh, the, on, on, the surrender occurred on Thursday, again Thursday, everything seems to be Thursday, Thursday the 25th of December. They, they made every effort to counterattack the gap. 
The Royal Navy were sent up in trucks from Aberdeen in their blue uniforms and steel helmets, unfamiliar 303 rifles, some of them armed with shotguns. The Royal Engineers were sent up from their base at Shuston Hill. The Royal Scots attacked first in, in uh, company strength and then in battalion strength. You know, every, every effort was made gallantly to attack the Japanese, but apart from that attack, most of the counterattacks were no more than company size. Um, and remember, you've got, you've got, you've got, you know, even by this point, you've got um, at least 6,000 6, men uh, at Wong Nai Chung Gap. Uh, when I say men, enemy, Japanese. So the Japanese you know, gain a reputation for being brutal during the war. Do we see it this early on in, in the fighting for Hong Kong? We do. We see it on the first evening, on the night of Thursday the 18th, Friday the 19th. I suppose the first atrocity to occur was at Sai Wan anti-aircraft fort. They were taken by surprise. Uh, most of them had been sheltering under the um, uh, in, in their sort of air raid bunker. Somebody went out, I don't know, for a, to the latrine or for a smoke, and the, saw that the sentries weren't there, and then saw Japanese troops in the in the uh, gun positions. He went back into the air raid shelter to warn the um, the other gunners to, to get out. The Japanese were in the gun pits. A brief fight was soon ended. Some managed to get away down the hill. Those that were left, probably about 20 or 25, uh, were captured and put into a disused magazine. And after a while, they were taken out uh, one by one. And as they came out, they were bayoneted to death. And the bodies were then slung over a wall with a drop of maybe 10 foot or something like that. Um, so they formed a sort of heap of bodies. And amazingly, two soldiers survived. Um, despite the, their bayonet wounds. And they talk of how they could hear the groaning around them. And every now and again, the Japanese would throw rocks down uh, to quieten them up. They they remained in that heap of bodies for, I think it was like two or three days, by which time the Japanese had moved on and they were able to escape. And these gunners were mostly, but not all, Chinese. And so they were, they were able to sort of like, you know, Don civilian clothes and um, and escape more easily than a, 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 a Caucasian could. Yeah, yeah. It just seems endemic, does this, uh, the bar 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 barbarity of the first of the Japanese on the attack on Hong Kong Island. As mentioned, they were very brave. They are very you know, kind of good soldiers in a military point of view. But they were utterly inhumane and barbaric. And you know, it's interesting you know, to see their mindset because... When, when they captured Wong Nai Chung Gap, they also managed to capture West Brigade, West Infantry Brigade, Brigade HQ. So the infantry on the island were split into an East Brigade and a West Brigade. And the West Brigade was commanded by um, a Brigadier John Lawson. And his HQ happened to be at Wong Nai Chung Gap. So when the Japanese arrived in that area, he was surrounded. Um, his HQ was coming under direct fire. The British military commander did everything he could to um, try and rescue the brigadier and extricate him from his besieged position, but every effort failed. And eventually, at about 10 o'clock in the morning on Friday the 19th of December, Lawson said to the military commander on the telephone that you know he was still surrounded by Japanese troops and he was going out to try and fight his way out. So he left his bunkers moved down the passageway out onto the road and was shot by machine gun fire, uh, breaking his femur, and as a result, he bled to death on the road. The, there were pockets of resistance around Wong Lai Chung, Chung Gap that carried on fighting until the 22nd of December, so for a, a couple more days. And after that resistance had been snuffed out, Lawson's body was found by the padre of um, the Winnipeg Grenadiers, who ripped off his identity disc, which he wore around his neck, and surprisingly managed to keep it with him throughout the whole of his interment. And after the war, he um, presented it to um, John Lawson's widow, Augusta, and still held by the family to this day. But for the Japanese, when they came across the body 
of a brigadier. They were astounded that so senior officer, an officer would be killed in action. So they gave him a proper, decent burial with a post, you know, a marker post. And again, they did something very similar at the anti-aircraft gun position at Wong Mai Chung Gap, where a couple of British gunners had locked themselves up in a steel-doored ammunition locker and refused to come out, despite every effort by the Japanese to get them to come out. So the Japanese left them there overnight, and the next day they forced an entry. And when they opened up the ammunition locker, they found the two British servicemen had shot themselves with their handguns. Now, the Japanese, again, gave them a very decent um, burial and treated them, their dead bodies, with the utmost respect. And the reason is that to the Japanese, shooting yourself rather than surrendering was a very Japanese thing to do. To them, this, they, this, they understood this. This was like the Japanese psyche. This was the way of the warrior. And the same with a senior officer like John Lawson dying in action. You know, this was Japanese. This they understood. This they, they respected. John Lawson, Brigadier Lawson, he was the most senior Canadian officer to be killed in the whole of the Second World War in action. And he was also the most senior officer to be killed in the Battle of Hong Kong. And I think that's another reason, you know, why, you know, well, what, well that and the fact that, you know, it was, Can it was Canadians' first action in World War Two, you know, it's part of the story why it's so well remembered in Canada and, and so much better remembered than it is in um, the UK. So what happens uh, at, at the end? For everybody, they knew that, that the battle had been lost, but it was a question of, for the very senior officers, for holding on for as long as, absolutely as long as possible. And when, and when the surrender did come, the Japanese, I mean, what's that title of the book? The barbarians are at the gates. The, Jap the Japanese were at the gates of the city. They were close to the naval dockyard. The Royal Navy were lining the parapets of the uh, dockyard walls uh, and were going to fight to the end. But there was a huge number of civilians living in the mid-levels on the peak and many of them taking refuge in public buildings like hotels or banks in the city of Victoria. So it got to a point where in the afternoon on Christmas Day, the military commander asked the commander of the middle regiment who were fighting on the streets of Wan Chai, fighting street to street, house to house, how long the existing front line could hold. And the message he got back was about one hour. And after that, they would withdraw to a support line which had been hastily um, assembled. And once they were through that, they were into the city of Victoria. So the military commander then went to the governor, Sir Mark Young, commander-in-chief. So he's, he's governor and commander-in-chief of the military. And told him the time had come to surrender. And then after that, the battalion commander of the Middlesex Regiment, one staff officer and a British orderly carrying a white flag were ordered to proceed through the streets of Wen Chai until they came to the nearest Japanese commander and um, offer surrender. White flags were starting to appear as uh, news got out that the um, order had come to surrender. The three men who had the unenviable job of carrying the surrender to the enemy marched in the middle of the road. It was already getting quiet. The noise of gunfire was abating. White flags were seen here and there. They approached a Japanese position the officer in charge was taken a bit by surprise. He didn't know what to do, so he offered them tea. They drank their tea, and in the meantime, um, Japanese staff officers came. They were then taken to another Japanese HQ, a major HQ, the, H the main HQ on the island. It was decided that the military commander and the governor should come themselves so they came, and they were taken across to the harbour where the surrender was formally um, signed uh, that evening under candlelight at the Peninsula Hotel. And then the Japanese occupation began, which was very brutal, characterised by starvation, shortages, 
forced repatriation of Chinese back across the frontier into their villages in Guangdong. Of course, many men would then die during the period as prisoners of war from disease, brutality, um, lack of medicine, uh, starvation, and it would be three and a half years uh, before the lights came on again and the uh, British Pacific Fleet sailed into Hong Kong Harbour in August 1945. Well, Philip, that seems like a, a natural place to end. I enjoyed that very much. Thank you. Loyal listener, if you want to know more, you can find Philip at battleforhongkong.blogspot.com and his book is A Battle for Hong Kong, December 1941. As ever, I will put a link on the website, www.podcast.com. Don't forget, if you've enjoyed this and would like to support the show, you can find out more at patreon.com slash www.podcast. Well, that's all for now. I'm Angus Wallace, and thanks for listening. <laughs>